Praise the Lord. Amen. So it's my honor uh, to introduce this next speaker. I've been working with this man of God for about a decade now, and he's been like a dad to me that I never had. He's, you know, just been that wise counsel that you can turn to when things are going south with family or your kids or just things getting fired from jobs because of preaching, you know, early on in my walk, you know, you know, and, um, you know, this guy has been here for me and uh, traveled the world with him, remote areas of Central America with this man, uh, in prison in Russia with this man, the Lord literally sent what, what the only, ex, the only explanation, excuse me, after that worship, just been singing my heart out, man. Uh, short testimony, um, you know, we fly into uh, Moscow, Russia, and um, this is 2018 for the uh, World Cup, and we uh, go to St. Petersburg from there, and, you know, we're getting detained in St. Petersburg, Russia every day for the first few days, and then... I believe the fourth day they, they finally had enough of us because <laughs> we got, you know, playing stupid, you know? It's illegal to pass out tracks there, let alone raise up banners. Pitar, Pitar's there with us. Uh, Ruben and uh, Dean was there doing photography. And I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah. Um, so fourth day, I believe it was, they sent the paddy wagon, like, take them away, you know? <laughs> take us to jail in Russia. And, you know, we... Okay, so we go to jail, they take us through one locked door, another locked door into a detaining room, and then they move us to the detaining room into this other room, and they're speaking Russian, we don't know what's going on, you know, and, and long story short, believe me, we were there for quite a while, they took our, all of our equipment and everything, and they're like, we're going to let you up the, there's a, they're saying, there's a riot outside, they made it sound like in the broken English this lieutenant was speaking, he's like, you know, they got pitchforks outside, you know, they're about to, they're about to uh, torch the place and ransack the place and, and we're going to have to take you out the back door. <laughs> we're not going out the back door, we're going out the front door we came in. And um, so we're going back and forth, hours go by. I get on the phone, they didn't take our phones or our passport. I get on the phone and I get a hold of a Marine at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, you know, saying, and there was a couple of veterans, me and another guy, like, hey, we're, uh, you know, U.S. veterans being held against our will. We're missionaries from America here to preach the gospel and share the message of Jesus Christ to the people at the World Cup. We're being detained against our will here in St. Petersburg, Russia. So I let the U.S. Embassy know, and I don't know what happened hours later, um, but what happened was this woman somehow uh, turns out she was she says that she was a peacekeeper from cambodia she had this it looked like she'd been hung her, her neck had this huge scar across it like she'd been hung or something before and so somehow some way this woman who actually we saw outside the subway who was actually saying that she was an atheist who was actually kind of heckling us and contending with us out as we were preaching in the crowds at the subway in St. Petersburg, somehow, some way, this woman got through all of the locked, closed doors back into the room where we were being detained. Nobody ever said a word to her. None of the police, no one ever spoke to her in any language. And she just walked in there like she owned the place and sat down next to us. And I can't remember, I think she was next to Larry Kraft or Ruben, I don't remember, but she said, whatever you do, do not let them take your blood. Because what they were doing was they were, they were sending a ambulance and these two people, a man and a woman came in with a big medical back, back uh, like a, a satchel and they opened it up and it had these files and syringes and everything. They were gonna take our, they were gonna try to take our blood and put us in a mental hospital. But the, I believe the Lord sent an angel in there because nobody ever talked to this woman, nobody ever let her in, nobody ever even acknowledged her or addressed her. And she came in there and, you know, just at a time and, and, and comforted us and, and encouraged us. And, and uh, when we left, 
um, they let us out and they never said a word to her. And so she was either KGB or an angel. So my point of bringing this up was that I've been in so many jams like that with this man of God that I know the Lord is with him. Amen. And the favor of the Lord is upon him. We've been, we were kicked out of, we're banned from the country of Canada. You know, we were in deportation for Canada for hours, you know, and they're bringing out files from the FBI and, you know, and treating us like we're terrorists or something. And so I've traveled across the Pacific, the Atlantic, North and South with this man. I've pled with this man. And this man is, has been a mighty uh, friend to me, a mighty man of God, an uncle, a father, a, a brother. And I'm so honored to introduce up here Reuben Israel. Come on. Amen. But uh, first of all, let me remind you that this weekend is Memorial Weekend. Those are the real heroes. Amen. Those are the reason why we actually have so much freedom in this country. And for many of you that assume, oh, America is going to hell in a handbasket, I've been hearing that since 1979. Go to another country and do what you're doing here today. Right. You will kiss the ground that you con condemn and say is ungodly. We still are considered a Christian nation in other parts of this world. And so uh, uh, we need to thank um, this weekend for our free speech of those guys who do that. Amen. Uh, a little bit about myself, if you're used to a preacher saying hallelujah, glory to God, thank you Jesus. That doesn't happen when I teach. It's right to the point. And I don't need fill-in words. You'll understand that. But if you're used to all of that, uh, you might be in for a shock. What we have is some photos here that uh, we're pushing. And uh, these are pictures that, um, um, you know, of dealing with police across this nation. Bible college does not teach getting arrested for Jesus. Bible college just don't do that. It's amazing how many people that boast to be apostles would never understand what it's like to sit in a jail cell for your faith. It's unique. It's beyond Bible study. It's beyond a worship service. When you're in that cell, uh, there ain't you and God. That's it. And so it, it makes you taste of the Bible. All of these pictures that you see are from coast to coast, and I've been arguing free speech. You may despise everything that I do, how I preach, those that I associate with. However, if ever you get arrested, cited, your attorney will most likely use one of our cases. So I didn't know I was going to be involved in this stuff. Uh, but this is what I do when I go out. I, you know, start contending for, uh, for our free speech. And because I've been doing it for over 40 years, um, I've got the reputation. So oftentimes, just showing up at a city, they will send 15 police officers with me the whole time I'm there. Okay. Now, it's, it's different if you preached at a college campus. Okay. At a college campus, you're going to get campus police. When you go to a city like Chicago that has millions of people and uh, the chief of police decides to say, Reuben, I know when you come into town you've got an agenda. Let me know what you're doing. You'll have 20 officers around you. This is, this is real crime. This is homicide. This is carjacking. All I do is hold a sign on the sidewalk. But you cause that much of a stir in the city, this is a result of what will happen. The book of Acts is filled with arrests and court. It's amazing. Somebody can be 60 years old in the Lord and don't know what it's like to hear that jail uh, a door slam. 
And, you know, I've said, and so many of them I just can't remember. Everybody in that cell is innocent. I've done prison ministries too. Everybody in that prison is innocent. You're the only guy who says, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of preaching Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And it's going to continue right now. That's right. And so uh, I'm very thankful God made me the way I am. I'm very thankful I look the way I do. Because if you're a little infeminate and you get put in, uh, in a cell with a bunch of felons, which sometimes city might do to teach you a lesson, these guys will eat you alive. Right. You want to see your Bible come alive? These guys will eat you alive. The book of Acts is filled with court cases, is filled with uh, arrests. And in case Bible college didn't teach you, the book of Acts does not have an ending. Over my 40 years, I can't recall how many times I've been arrested. You lose count after a while. You lose count how many times you go to court. And um, like uh, John Williams mentioned, uh, Canada banned us for the rest of our lives. It's one thing to be banned from an event, or a city, or maybe even a campus. But when an entire country considers you a threat, they banned us. And I remember when they were talking to me, uh, up came over three pages of all my arrests. And this officer is looking at me saying, uh, no, you, you're going to be a threat to our country. And we can't have you here. And so, uh, you know, praise God. Uh, you know, this is, again, I come back uh, to America, I still have free speech. So watch what you say when you consider America as the uh, new Babylonian world. We still have much. We still have much on free speech. Uh, and if you go to Russia and do what we do, you might uh, come back and, and kiss the soil that you've been mocking. Amen. Amen. So with working with police, and all the things that have happened in my 40 years, which by the way, my testimony is not Hollywood. I don't come from the drugs and the alcohol that most of you came. I actually had wonderful parents that wired me. I never got involved in that stuff. And so uh, I represent the prodigal son's brother. Uh, you know, I still need the same Jesus Christ, but I didn't have this stuff. In, in, in the house that I grew up in, you don't get arrested. You're a criminal. As a Christian, man, that, that was thrown out the window. Uh, my parents taught you shouldn't have a lawyer, only criminals, politicians, and doctors. Now I've got lawyers all over my cell phone, and they want to come and defend uh, your right for free speech. Almost every month we're working on a case here in the States. And these are guys that don't have a YouTube page, these are guys that don't have a Facebook page. These are guys that are absolutely invisible, but yet they're still getting arrested too. You may not hear about them, comes across my desk, I gotta get involved to get this guy out of this. Find him an attorney and, um, and get it taken care of. We do not find the disciples protesting King Herod when John was arrested. Because when you go out and preach with me, maybe not other ministries, but when you go out and preach with me and you get arrested, we are not shutting down to preach to get you out of jail. You're gonna sit there till we're done. We came to preach a message to that city and we'll eventually get to you. So don't think uh, that we're gonna shut it all down and try to get you out of jail. It's not gonna happen, at least with our group. We will eventually get you out when we can, when we do. But uh, the paramount reason of why we're in that city is to preach Jesus Christ. And getting arrested, and getting uh, time in jail, that's, it should be normal. I talk about this all the time. Our home church, and when we have meetings, we read Martyr's Mirror quite often. 
Not because we want to be these people. I want you to understand when it does happen to you, you're going to take it as normal as breathing. That's it. It's very normal. I got arrested about six months ago in L.A. Never saw anything over Facebook. It's normal for me. These things do happen. And, of course, the um, city attorney uh, dropped everything uh, as a result of we don't have a track record of doing some of these things. As a matter of fact, we've worked with LAPD over the years. And for those of you that may not know, there are Christians in California. So uh, anytime Hollywood has a, an event, uh, you know, Academy Awards, Grammy Awards, these guys have been hearing the Word of God for decades. So uh, there's a lot to do in that particular state, as liberal as it is. But you begin to know the police, they begin to know you by name. Uh, they'll call me, uh, Reuben, we're going to have this event, are you coming, and if so, let us know how many's coming with you. We don't just show up and say, well, Lord, what would you like to lead us to do? We got a game plan when we're out there. And as a young man, I saw that in Matthew chapter 10. When you work with a group of people, you need to keep them all on the same page. Amen. Matthew chapter 10 is unique because Jesus told them where to go. And he even told them cities not to go. Right. He gave them a specific message to preach. He told them what's going to happen when they get out there. So it's not just a worship service and let's go out and be led of the Lord. I run things a little bit differently. I make sure things are briefed prior to, and then after it's done, there's a briefing. If I see any error that needs to be cleaned up, uh, we do take care of it. But working with a group is a little bit different. And when you work with a group, guys, you get, you get response like this. The officers know that they're going to work with you. Salt Lake City, it's Mormons. You think it's hard to preach to sinners? Try preaching to religious people. Those are the ones that killed men of God. Not a homo, not a drunk. Religious people. Well, when we started preaching in Salt Lake City, uh, which is a picture right there, uh, the amount of argument that we had to go to court in that city off the charts. Because the church is in bed with the police. The church is in bed with the media. The church is in bed with the, uh, the mayor. You talk about an uphill fight. We fought so much in Salt Lake City, it's amazing. However, what they decided to do is right next to their main street uh, was the Mormon temple. The Latter-day Saints decided to buy that section of Main Street to officially tell me, uh, Reuben, it is now private property. You can no longer stand there. It cost the church about $60 million. Okay, a motley crew of street preachers did that. So, uh, I do understand by being on the same page. Uh, we had a lot of problems going into Salt Lake City. Constant problems all the time. We were going to be arrested. They wanted to do certain things. And we had to fight for free speech out there like you wouldn't believe. Again, it's religion. Religion's always the problem. And it doesn't just stop here in America. It, you know, it, uh, uh, Pitor will know this story. We're in Russia, and we're getting arrested and detained every day. And uh, they warn us, you cannot go out and do this again. Oh, okay, sorry, we're Americans, we don't know any different. What did we do as soon as we left the police? Boom, we went out there and did it again. Got arrested numerous times. This was during the World Cup soccer. And uh, Trump was going to meet with the president of Russia after World Cup soccer. And so what happened is they put us in a pretty good sized room 
with four chairs, and we sat there, and we had a bunch of suits, police officers, and military, all against the wall. And they're looking at us. Nobody's saying a word. You know, we're sitting in this chair thinking, okay, I don't know how this one's going to go down, but uh, I think we're going to go to jail on this one. And uh, finally, the double doors open, and in comes this uh, high-ranking military guy, and he's got an interpreter with him. And uh, judging by his boots clacking on the ground, this guy was there for business. And he walks right up to me. And he tells the interpreter for me to stand up. And then he says, I want to see what your banner says. So I unrolled the banner and he read it flip side. I flipped the banner, he read it. Everybody in the room is not saying a word. And sometimes testimonies can exaggerate, but with Peter, he knows what I'm talking about is true. This guy, whoever he was, actually walked up to me first, almost bowed down, and shook my hand. Then he went up to each guy individually and did the same thing. Saints, you can make an impact, not just on a college campus, but you can make an impact in an entirely different country. What they concluded was obviously we're CIA. Nobody can do what you guys do unless you're CIA. As a matter of fact, Trump personally sent us out there to see what he's going to do. It's amazing. Hey, I can care less what they consider. Just let me go preach. And so, uh, but that was a unique thing. We knew we were going to get in trouble. And when this guy bowed in front of each of us, and then uh, turned around and left the room, and uh, then the room started to you know, exit, and we're just looking at each other. This is the type of impact we had to make. This is the type of impact that's made in Bible. You know, the Bible talks about, uh, you're going to stand before kings. <laughs> Christians today may not even know who the uh, uh, mayor is. Your city council doesn't even know you exist. That's the difference between those men in the Bible and maybe even yourself. People knew who they were. Those guys showed up, there's going to be things that happen. Numerous times that we find in the Bible, no small stir. No small stir means, obviously, they made a stir. There could be a reason why many of you don't experience police being called and you've got to argue free speech. And uh, the reason is very simple. Jesus Christ made this statement. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify that the works thereof are evil. Okay, if your preaching doesn't get a response from the crowd, you've got a deluded preaching. Hate to bust your bubble. Jesus made it very clear. The world's going to hate you. And it will hate you when you testify that the work is evil. Believers as well. We got a Catholic event in L.A. that the brothers are taking care of today. And uh, you don't think they're going to cause a problem out there? Blessing is it's in Anaheim. And uh, the police in Anaheim know us and give us a lot of liberty. But again... Let me just make this very clear. We earned that liberty. We worked at it. You can't just go out one time, talk to a police officer, and assume this is going to happen. That's right. You're talking decades of getting arrested. You're talking decades of going to jail. And so uh, after a while, they do conclude, this guy doesn't have a problem. You can arrest him, he'll be back out again. In fact, some of my arrests, I've had a judge come in and uh, remove everything that uh, had happened. It just shredded everything. Doesn't exist. So these things will happen too. I'm not special. The only reason I got these stories is because I go out and preach. And I know when I go out and preach, it's going to cause a reaction. A big reaction. It's not going to, I'm not going to fly from Los Angeles to Boston 
to give a track to one guy or to pray for somebody. I can do that fine in L.A. I came to Boston to cause a stir. Right. You know, when God pulls a guy like me out of the bullpen, uh, there's going to be some problems in the city and they know it. When confronted by a police, and Bible college doesn't teach you, so I'm going to give you some tips. When confronted by the police, how you deal with that officer within three seconds is going to pivot what's going to happen. Okay. Take your hands out of your pocket. You can tell most of the time I put my sunglasses over my forehead so they can see my eyes. I'm not twitching. Okay. Officers don't have what we call discernment. Uh, academy teaches body language. And if they see you flinching, um, you know, you just cause some alarm. If they see that you're nervous, uh, they're going to find out more about you. So when they come and uh, you deal with them, uh, they really don't know what to do because uh, they can sense you've got authority. A Jesus met with a centurion. This is a centurion. He could have sent 20 soldiers to grab Jesus and bring him over. But he himself personally went there and beseeched Jesus. I know you're a man of authority just like I am. They understand the authority. The sad commentary is uh, over the years, uh, I've been accused of being a government agent here in America. I've been accused of being law enforcement. I've been accused of all kinds of stuff. That's the last thing. The sad part about that is when you see a person that has authority, that speaks with authority, that walks with authority, you don't think Christian. You think law enforcement. Isn't that amazing that the church can't put that together? Uh, no, the only reason I have favor with the police is because I've earned it. I've been cuffed so many times, I had my head slammed against squad cars. I hear what you're saying. You're not going to get a, a group hug from me. You want persecution, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read Martyrs Mirror. That's the early church. And that's even going on um, in other parts of, this, uh, of these uh, uh, countries here in, in, uh, this, in, in the globe today. So it's not, just because you may not experience it, doesn't mean it's not happening. They do watch your body language. They do watch how you respond. If you twitch, if you're moving, if your sentence has a lot of, ah, uh, well, uh, you know, and he asks you, what are you doing here? You can't say, well, Jesus told me to come here. Uh, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work in court. Uh, I'm here because of this. Usually the officer said you can't protest. You want to define you're not here to protest. Right. You're here to preach. Yeah. You know, I, what do I have against this particular building? I have nothing to protest in. I'm here to exercise my religious freedom uh, on the sidewalk. And so uh, instantly try to remove that word protest from him. Oftentimes officers will tell you, you need to keep moving on the sidewalk. Don't stand still. And there is a code. Most cities have a code for this. But the code has everything to do with a union strike. It has nothing to do with your religious freedom. If you ever see a union strike, these guys are out there with side, on the sidewalk with signs, and they don't want them to stop at the front door. Then they'll block people from going in. They don't want them to stop at the driveway. They'll block uh, commerce. So the law is there. But it has nothing to do with what you and I do. And we need to understand this. When we deal with police, you need to lower the law. And uh, in New Orleans, I remember an officer came up and said, you know the, uh, the code here in New Orleans, it's, it's no amplification. And he's quoting it to me. So I'm letting the guy finish. And when he's done, I said, officer, if you read down, 
The code has everything to say that uh, uh, religious groups are exempted from this. And uh, he looked at it and he says, uh, just keep the volume down. <laughs> you, you need to give police a bone. Okay, don't think for one second you're going to discuss free speech with this guy. Unfortunately, the academy doesn't teach them free speech. A question that I normally get asked regarding free speech is, uh, Brother Rubin, I get asked to show my ID. I know my constitutional right. Do I show my ID? We've debated this since the late 80s, so uh, I'm very aware of the position people take on that. My advice to you is speed up the process. Give them your ID. If you have nothing to hide, give them the ID. Matter of fact, quite frankly, they probably know who you are anyway. They just know you may not give it up and they want to cuff you. The officer can clearly say, uh, I am responding to a call, therefore I am investigating something, and uh, uh, because it's an investigation, I need to know who I'm talking to. He can drag you in, he can uh, fingerprint you, he can, uh, he can keep you in jail for uh, quite a bit of time. Usually when you're in jail, you're out within uh, six to eight hours if everything's fine. But they can hide you around, move you around. Again, you're dealing with, if you're a nuisance to a particular city, they're gonna do that. Oftentimes when I am uh, involved with police, I'll ask them, sir, would you like to see my ID? Just that statement alone, 85% of the time, the officer looks at me and says, no thank you. So rather than him saying, I need to see your ID, I volunteer. And uh, usually he's going to just say, no thank you. It's fine. They do know who we are anyway. So I would say, um, you know, you don't have a problem. We're not there for the Bill of Rights. We're not there for constitutional reasons. We're there to promote Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, you're going to understand, you're going to be falsely accused of things your entire Christian life. They're going to accuse you of stuff, and even when they arrest you, it's going to be false charges. Uh, the way the police department works is they'll arrest you, maybe against uh, three charges, but tell you, um, if you plead guilty to this one, we'll drop the other two. Uh, no, don't do that. Continue to fight. It's very common within uh, many street preachers is to put a video of the arrest on YouTube or Facebook. You need to remove that instantly. You do not want to show the guy you're going to be most likely going to court over what you have. There's a discovery process. And during the discovery process, then he can know what you've got. Much like you don't have uh, access to his camera around him, um, he shouldn't be able to see yours, even if he asked for it. No thanks. If you choose to arrest me, you'll, you'll know in due time what I have. So if you do have a um, video, uh, don't be so quick to put it on. Try to avoid it. And, you know, I know a lot of young street preachers, they love to do that. Hey, I just got arrested the first time. Uh, just leave it. When an officer tells you, if you don't leave, I will be arrested, that's all he needs to say. Once that happens, you, you submit that uh, footage to your attorney, and then we go to court. You walk away. You don't gripe, you don't complain, you walk away. It looks like you just ran away with your tail between the legs. Nothing's further from the truth. We were in Dearborn uh, probably about uh, six, maybe seven years ago. And uh, that city is uh, Muslim. That city, when we showed up, <laughs> absolutely turned into a riot. And for an hour and a half, this is on video, they threw everything that is loose at us. 
I mean, these brothers that I was with, they got hit with stuff for an hour and a half. Not one of them threw anything back. Finally, one of the main officers in Dearborn walks up and he says, Reuben, I got to tell you right now, if you don't leave, I will arrest you. It's all I need. My head's bleeding. Matter of fact, there's a photo that somebody took that I didn't even uh, know at the time, but the cut on my forehead was in the shape of a cross, and it's bleeding. So, we, uh, I told the guys, pack it up, we're done. And of course, the crowd is just cheering. Right. Um, we took them to court. That case went to the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, when Trump was impeached, they said that what he said caused riotous words to happen what uh, took place during the Capitol. And they said, you, Trump, caused this problem. Well, you know what uh, Trump's high dollar attorney, what case they used? Our case in Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan, has refused to host another Muslim event. And the only reason we got there was because the police arrested four guys for just passing out tracks. And uh, when that came across my desk, I'm like, you gonna arrest these guys for passing out tracks? You're gonna resent this day. Now you brought us. And things are gonna change a little bit. And uh, it sure did. So, you know, you don't have a lot of Muslims actually say, we're going to shut down the whole thing. And it was because of us. Uh, we had to fight this thing over and over and over. If your case goes to court, it may take years. Okay? This is not an episode of law and order where uh, you're going to be uh, told guilty, not guilty, and walk away. It may take years. Are you going to be around for the long haul? Uh, that's something you need to consider. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, shifting gears. Usually when police come up to me, uh, at least the brothers that I'm with in Los Angeles, we shift gears. You're not going to say you're a whore, you're a homo, you're all going to burn. You've just added fuel to why this officer is checking you out. So what we do is we modify the message. Hey, you live in America, why would you not believe in God? Instantly. So this officer is a little bit confused on the call that he's going and now what we're saying. You can't be stuck on one gear. You need to learn to shift gears, especially if you're dealing with law enforcement. Because all they're doing is responding to a call. And um, you need to know when to shift gears. Uh, you can always say what you say after they pack up and leave. Or even if you didn't, it was already communicated to the people uh, prior to them coming out to you. But you definitely want to learn how to shift gears. The police officer is not the evil centurion that's going to take you to the cross. He's simply doing his job. Some of them stretch it, some of them don't. So don't have a chip on your shoulder that these officers are nothing more than evil centurions that want to haul you away. Cities have been sued for free speech. They understand that, so now they handle you with kid gloves. I appreciate it when cops show up and they kind of have a meeting uh, half a block away. They're trying to figure out what to do with you. I'd rather have that than come some cop show up and try to muscle his way and shut you down. When you see an officer using his cell phone, he's talking to somebody about what to do with you. Okay? He can't use the radio because if he used the radio in court, that's public. We need to see exactly what they're talking about. Versus his cell phone, we have no idea, and he can get away with all kinds of stuff. So when you see an officer with a cell phone, 
uh, do understand they're trying to figure out a way to stop it. Gentlemen, we're always the visiting team. These same officers that I work with can be the same officers that'll cuff me tomorrow. They're not the evil century. Uh, when you are out preaching, your motive is to not be arrested. If the officer said leave and you got it on video, that's plenty. But you don't want to get arrested. You get arrested, it's no longer a free speech case. It's a criminal matter. That has to be dealt with and that may take some time before you get into the free speech area. So try to avoid the arrest. And uh, all you want that officer to say is, I'm going to arrest you. You know, and, and that's something you can ask. If I don't leave, officer, am I going to be cited or arrested? Yes. End of conversation, guys. Pack up, walk away. Go preach someplace else. We've got plenty of evidence that we can cause a lot of problems to that uh, city. There are cities that we've uh, sued, and we've had them take class on free speech. Street preachers. It's amazing what can happen. When I serve God, I expect to cause an issue for the Lord. I don't want to just go out there and just uh, share Jesus with one or two people. I expect to cause a big commotion, and most of the time it does happen. When we were going to court in Salt Lake City, um, I had to come in for a particular hearing prior to the court. And so my attorney contacted me and said, uh, uh, Reuben, they'd like you to come into Utah uh, on Wednesday. And uh, my response was, uh, I, I can't do it Wednesday. I can be there Friday, but not Wednesday. So he called them back, he calls me, and he says, no, they want to go Wednesday. It's not negotiable. Okay. So what I told my attorney to tell them is, I'll show up on Wednesday and I'm going to stay in Salt Lake City till Friday and tell them they know what I'm going to be doing. I got a call back from my attorney who says, Friday's fine. Imagine a guy with a sign on a public sidewalk in a city that has, uh, you know, a couple million people and you're considered a threat. A guy with a sign. When I landed at the airport, uh, my attorney was there, along with the city attorney, a few other court people, and uh, several officers. And so I asked my attorney, where are we going to have this meeting? You know, we go into your office, their office. He says, uh, no, Reuben, they don't want you to leave the airport. <laughs> so we have a room here at the airport, a lounge, which we're gonna go ahead and conduct the meeting then, and uh, then we'll put you back on the plane and you're done. So, uh, you know, we finished the meeting and uh, the officer was by me the whole time to make sure I got on that plane. Guys, this is, this is just for a guy that talks about Jesus Christ. I'm not bringing drugs in. We're not committing homicide out there just goes to show you that how much a threat you can be if you really don't quench the Holy Ghost. If you really get out there with some authority, with some power. <laughs> Having footage is something that you need. That camera is not biased. That camera doesn't lie. That camera is not prejudiced. It gives you everything. And so uh, you need to make sure your camera's going, everything is filmed, and uh, um, when you actually go to court, they want to see the entire thing. Don't mess with it, don't chop it up, don't splice it, don't edit it, just uh, submit it to, um, to your attorney, and in due time, it'll be brought up. Usually the cases are dropped. Okay. Out of all the times I've been arrested, they get dropped. 
After a while, the city says, do we really want to pursue this? We were at a, uh, a Mormon conference that we go twice a year in Salt Lake City, and uh, I was in an area that they consider a uh, no free speech zone. And um, the officers came up and they said, Reuben, do you realize you can't stand here? It's illegal. And it was brought up during the last session when we had a meeting. And my response to it getting brought up was, do we really want to take this guy to court? Do we really want to spend as much money as we can knowing we're going to lose the case? So we just simply decided, stay here. It's fine. Your reputation should proceed you. Uh, I shouldn't have to contact the police and say, this is who I am, this is the court cases that we won. Your reputation should proceed you. The book of Acts is filled with court cases. Paul used his Roman citizenship to argue his case. It's amazing. Christians understand that. They see this. But uh, my question is again, do you know what it's like to sit in a jail cell for Jesus Christ? It's, uh, it's a blessing. And when you're in that cell, you're not thinking, I'm suing. When you're in that cell, you're not thinking, I hate these people. That evil, wicked police officer. Your motive should be, you should be rejoicing. Right. That should be your motive. I do understand what you're getting involved in. It's one thing to be arrested in your hometown. It's quite another to be arrested in uh, Arizona. And so uh, in Arizona, the police uh, give us a lot of treatment. It's to the point now that uh, several departments not only give us police, they give us parking too. They allow us to pull up with no license plate because they know after the event, we walk back to our car two blocks away, it, it's gonna be a, a pro. So they will give us parking. And so uh, uh, you will be surprised what you can do if you continue. You gotta keep hammering it. You gotta keep doing it. Uh, and it may take four or five years and numerous arrests before they actually look at you and think, wow, this guy sincerely believes in what he believes. Amen. I'm going to share something that uh, you may not, uh, you, I'm sure you're very familiar with it, but I'm going to splice it in now. When you actually preach the way we do, and you meet mayors, the entire country kicks you out. You've got a little bit of a reputation. And sometimes, uh, these people in the city actually have a great deal of respect for you. Don't ever forget that. They look at you like, wow, we arrest this guy and he goes right back at it again. We arrest this guy and he goes right back at it again. This is what happens in Mark 6. Herod feared John, knowing he was a just man, and unholy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Herod didn't have a chip on his shoulder. I'm going to kill that man. So if you think the entire city is after you, that's a chip on your shoulder. Kings actually said, wow, I'd like to meet this individual. It's Bible. You know, and, and we don't find John saying, Jesus loves you. He addressed the sin in Herod's life. He lost his head, not because he called the king an adulterer, but because of a bad bet. Jesus was in court. And the Bible says that Jesus saw uh, he, was a, uh, he was somebody in a different jurisdiction. He sent him over to, to heaven. 
Herod just happened to be in Jerusalem at that time. And the Bible says Pilate did not find fault in Jesus. Understand that. This is our Bible. If you think the entire world is against you, uh, you don't know much your Bible. He actually uh, didn't want to do anything to Jesus in court. Even Pilate's wife had a vision, and she's telling her husband not to do anything to this man. Bible teaches in Luke 23, 8, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he was desirous to meet him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he had hoped to see him uh, and the miracles that he did. Not everything is just a drag out fight, guys. Uh, there are people that uh, are high ranking. I can tell you stories. It'll get boring after a while. Who've heard about you, would like to meet you, and you've actually won them over. It takes persistence. Don't think two or three arrests and you're going to be, uh, you know, involved in the, major, in the mayor's uh, meetings. It may take years. But you see what Herod did. He was delighted. I've heard so much good stuff about you. He didn't say, I'm going to kill you. He was delighted. And they only say that because oftentimes when you go out and preach, you have this mentality that every police officer is out to get you. And they don't. I'm living proof. I work with them. Not all of them are that bad. You got bad police like you got bad clergy. You got bad police like you got bad politicians. They're not all the same. Really, an officer is not going to put his entire career on the line for you. I know in your world you think that's going to happen, but he's not going to do that. He worked very hard to get where he's at, and the last thing he wanted to do is lose a career because of you. Herod had no hostility. There was no bitterness against Jesus. He longed to see Jesus. Preaching in the city is a little bit different than preaching on a college campus. And a college campus, they have campus police, but they don't have a campus jail. I know, I've sat in there, it's more like the, uh, the principal's office. Uh, but when you preach at a city, you're talking a city of millions of people. Well, you must have made an impact. You know, when they say, uh, uh, Brother David's coming over to our town, we better, uh, we better assist him so his free speech uh, doesn't get hindered. It, not everything is a drag out fight, people. But how you handle the police will speak volumes of what you can do for the Lord. There's a verse in the Bible that says, um, makes even his enemies live at peace with him. So maybe the guy who actually was your enemy and had you arrested might be your best friend. Never. Underestimate what God can do. There are officers that uh, after a while we, um, we tend to uh, become very good friends over the years. When they uh, bought Main Street, the Mormons, uh, one of the main detectives came out and he says, Reuben, you, you heard they did buy Mormon, uh, Main Street. Yeah. And to show you what that really means, it's like Jesse causing such of a stir at a campus that several professors decided to get together and spend billions of dollars to buy the campus and let him know it's now a private campus. That's what the Mormons did when they bought Main Street. And this uh, detective walks over to me and he says, um, you know they bought Main Street, Reuben. Um, I will arrest you. He says, uh, I handpicked the officers. If you tell me how many are going to be with you. 
and he says, uh, here's the way it's going to go down. I'm going to warn you twice, and then I cuff you. And he says, because I know who you are, I'm going to cuff you in the front. He says, see these officers behind me? They've been waiting to cuff you. They want to slit your wrist. Yep. And so uh, I had volunteered at a meeting knowing you guys were going to go there. And I remember telling uh, Detective Jay, uh, Jay, they bought it. There's not much I can do. It belongs to them. And he's telling me, are you sure? I said, no, I've never lied to you. They own it. They bought it. Uh, I can go elsewhere and preach around the temple. And um, uh, this is the kind of favor you have with some police departments. Uh, they, um, he would rather have you arrested. There was an officer one time in New Orleans, and uh, we were staying at a church off of Bourbon Street, and we came in to get a little coffee, go to the bathroom. My phone rings, and um, it's this, um, this officer from New Orleans. And he says, uh, Reuben, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to you. Can you tell me where you're at? Are you in a quarter? And I said, yes. So I told him where I was at. He says, I'll be there in five minutes. So I remember walking up to the pulpit and telling all the street preachers that are sitting down, look, I may be going to jail. I have no idea what this guy wants, but I may be getting arrested. So continue on what we're doing. Hit the streets. I gave another brother one of the keys to the church. And uh, this officer showed up. Uh, this officer was asking a lot of questions in no particular manner. And he kept asking questions. And one of the questions he asked me was, um, how many cells do you have, Reuben? And I'm thinking, you mean like battery cells? Uh, I didn't know he was kind of referring to us like uh, Muslims having cells. And I said, you mean chapters? How many chapters of Bible believers? And he says, yeah, yeah. And I said, we got, we got about 80. At that time, we had about 75, 80. And um, uh, he says, okay. His job was to watch over us or take note of what it is that we did. He wouldn't go home until we went home. And usually we didn't go home until about one o'clock in the morning. So he stayed there the whole duration. New Orleans came up with a law at night on Bourbon Street. It is illegal to mention the word Jesus and talk politics. In America. In America. Well, at their briefing, of course, my name was brought up. You know the guy's going to get arrested. And so they asked this one detective who's been working with me for about a year and a half, you'll be cuffing Reuben. And he says, I ain't touching that man. He says, you have no idea what they go through on the streets. And he says, I'm not touching him. So because of that, they moved him to another uh, precinct and uh, didn't really appreciate that. We were arrested. Uh, we had to come up with $9,000 to get the guys out of, out of jail. Uh, we fought the case. Uh, we overturned it, and we got the money back. But uh, uh, what, what a law in America. At night, you can't talk about Jesus Christ. I have a, a stash of business cards from officers all over this country. Police that I... You know, that they give me the card and said, hey, can you do me a favor next time you come in? Can you let me know when you're coming? And we'll take care of that. It's card after, and this is just a small sample of what I have in my office. So, I say that, guys, because there's one particular card that is very dear to me. It's this one here. And this one uh, comes from a um, Secret Service agent. We were in uh, New Orleans, I believe it was Super Bowl, and one of the brothers that was with us, his brother is a big chef there in New Orleans. And his brother told Willie, do you know that five sitting presidents are coming into town? 
They asked me to cook for them. Well, that's, that's some pretty good information I got. Uh, you know, I, I know what to do at this point. I'll take it from here. So uh, we got the address and we showed up. This thing was um, in a warehouse area. This, this does not look like five presidents are going to be coming by in that building. And uh, we sat there, we double, triple checked the address, and uh, my decision was let's just wait it out and see what happens. About an hour after the sit down, about uh, six officers come out of the building. You can tell these boys mean business, they're not your regular street cop. All in trench coats, and the guy that was leading was this Secret Service. And uh, he walks right up to me and he says, um, so what's your intention? And I said, well, we know the presidents are here and uh, we wanted to give them a message. They did put their hand on the Bible. And he says, yes, we do have a free speech section over here for you. And I said, uh, come on, you didn't even know we were coming. There is no free speech section. <laughs> He looked at me, we kind of giggled a little bit, and uh, he says, uh, you know, can I ask you how you knew that uh, five presidents are coming in? And I said, well, I got ears to the ground. Left it at that. The guy says, you're right. In fact, they'll be rolling in in about 20 minutes, each limo at a time. And I said, well, you know, if you want to know who we are, he says, I don't need to know who you are. As a matter of fact, one of the detectives from New Orleans actually said, Ruben, shouldn't you be on Bourbon Street? <laughs> this guy said he flew in with the president. He flew in with the president and he heard that we were there and he knew me by name. <laughs> You're dealing with the government. And so, um, you know, I told the guy, I said, Dude, we have no harm for the presidents. We just want to remind them they didn't put their hand on the Bible. And uh, he actually said, uh, okay, that's all I need to know. And as a man turned around to walk away, he turned back towards me. I didn't give him any identification. I didn't tell him who I was. And he says, uh, oh, hey, by the way, Reuben, after you finish the Super Bowl, I know you're going to Salt Lake City for the Olympics. And he was right. And he says, here's my card. And he says, I'm putting my cell phone on the back of this car. And if you get a problem, please give me a call. The guy was in favor. He's our government and he's in favor of what it is that we do. So because you have a run-in with the police officer, don't think the apocalypse has officially started. Work with the police the best you can. And uh, this is a, a picture right here of Salt Lake City and it's the homo parade. That individual that I'm talking is the chief of police. He's walking the route, he leaves the route to make a beeline right to me, to shake my hand and say, is everything okay? Here's a guy that we took to court numerous times. Your enemy can be your friend. And he told me, he says, uh, Ruben, I'm gonna let you know right now. I'm here because I'm told to be here. That's why I'm the first one, so I can leave. So that may look like a regular picture, but that's, uh, that's uh, the chief of police in Salt Lake City. Thank you for your time.